it's great to see you here this morning as we conclude our sermon series, Extravagant Generosity, the Heart of Giving. And today, Extravagant Generosity as an expression of your heart. Uh, and uh, we're going to finish that today. But before we do that, as we begin this morning, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray together. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, that you are here with us in your Holy Spirit. That you're here to speak to our hearts and minds. To lift us up out of our fears, our anxiousness, our worries. To give us a sense of your hope your presence with us, your strength for us throughout our lives and into eternity. We give you thanks that you have given so much to us, more than we understand grace upon grace. We'd ask that you'd help us this day to open our hearts to the greatest of your gifts, your son, Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen. You know, my heart has really been encouraged over the past few weeks as I've uh, looked at the expressions of heart that uh, people have done uh, with these, these uh, heart cards that we've sent out to people. Uh, you know, the first one was about uh, what I loved about this church. The second one was who has uh, influenced me spiritually in my life. And the third one last week was about what are my hopes or visions for this church. And, and reading them has been just a, a great uh, opportunity to just be lifted in spirit. And if you haven't read those, they're all scattered around the church here. I want to make sure and ask you to do that. I mean, you will be encouraged as you read those things. Uh, and I was wanting to share this morning a, well, a matter of my heart with you. Uh, something that happened in my life this year. Uh, you know, uh, it's not exactly been the easiest of years around the Burkett household. Uh, I had a couple of eye surgeries and my wife uh, had, was diagnosed with cancer. And so she went through surgery for that. And we went through chemotherapy and what have you. And at one point in the spring, I decided I'd try and do something. Wanted to do something to encourage her as she was going through her chemo to kind of lift up her spirits and, and uh, to make her feel loved. And so what I decided to do was, well, I realized that she's a... A flower person. We got anybody in here that likes flowers? And a few people that like flowers. I know nothing about flowers. I mean, I see green and, you know, yellow and brown and stuff. I just, yeah, okay, it's out there. Great. I know nothing about flowers, but I decided what I was going to do was for her, I was going to get some pots and I was going to put them on the back porch and I was going to plant flowers in them. You know, those, those, those uh, flowers that you put in pots. <laughs> yeah, you got me. <laughs> You got me. I, I couldn't figure out what they were the last hour, and my wife finally yelled out, pansies. Okay, so pansies. Yeah, pansies that you put in pots in the spring. Uh, and then I decided what I was going to do is I was going to make a flower bed across the entire south side of the backyard. Uh, and then I was going to make it across the entire east side of the backyard. Uh, and I found out something. Gardening is expensive. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I, uh, and so I got out there and man, every, every day off that I had in the spring was spent uh, making these flower beds and I had to buy that, uh, that steel stuff that you put, her, uh, uh, what do you call that stuff? Uh, edging, edging, that's it, that's it. I had to buy that edging and I had to buy, you know, I'd go down to Lowe's and I'd buy, uh, I'd buy purple flowers and red flowers and, and white flowers and whatever kind of flowers there were, I don't know. And I'd put them in, you know, across the backyard. And I spent hours and hours and days and days of my day off. Uh, and I don't know how much money. I don't even want to know how much money I spent. Uh, and I uh, got all this stuff in. And I thought, well, I wonder if this worked. And so she would go over to the uh, chemo infusion center over Integris Procure up on the turnpike. And after she would get that, she would come home and... I had bought her a, one of those anti grav lounge chairs, loungers over at Sam's. You ever see one of those things? And I put it out on the back porch and I put the flower pots around the, the lounger. And, uh, the, and she, what she would do, she would come home and she would get a blanket because it was spring. And she would go out on the back porch and she would, she would sit on the back porch in that lounger between those flowers. And she would look at the flowers, the, whatever those things were that I planted out there on the south, you know. Uh, and she would sleep out there all afternoon. And I thought, success, success. You ever had an experience like that? Where you gave of yourself and you gave of what you had simply because you loved somebody else? And that was the only reason you gave? That is deeply biblical, deeply biblical. 
Did you hear that quote that, uh, from the uh, Gospel of John that Max read a little bit ago, very famous verse, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave. God is a giver. It's at the heart of who he is. It's at the core of his nature. And what the scripture says is God created you and me and he impressed upon us his image, the image of who he is in us. So that we are literally hardwired in order to be people who reach out to other people and show love and concern and care for other people and who are generous and who want to give for other people. That's who God created us to be. Now, the problem is that sometimes we get captured by our anxiousness and we get captured by our fear and we get drilled into us by our culture that, you know, you can never have enough. You always need more. And that stuff gets in us and it drives us away from God and it drives us away from who we're created to be. What, the kind of people that will make us happy, content. And it says that God loves us. And he gives his son for us so that we can come back to God and we can come back to who we really are. God is a giver and he molds us with a heart of generosity. You know, I've been really encouraged speaking about uh, a sense of generosity uh, over the past few weeks as we've taken a look at these different uh, card cards and and what i did yesterday was i came down and I, I read through some of them and i i pulled a few of them off uh that i wanted to read to you this morning uh and uh, just to give you a sense of the things that were written over the past few weeks by people uh, the first one was uh, uh on the ninth we had things i love about my church and i'm going to read these to you i'm not going to tell you the names or any of the names that are involved in this but listen to this things i love about my church the wonderful people the wonderful people. If you go around this building and you look at these cards, you will see over and over and over again, people talking about what I love about this church is I love the relationships. I love the sense that people here that they care about me, that they are here to encourage me and love me and strengthen me. There was one that wrote this, this is a very moving thing, says, when I come here, I feel my worth as a human being goes up. That's the impact that you make here. Wonderful people. And this continues on the opportunity to tell others about God, the God I love and what he has done for me, because that's, that's what we're here about. We're here because of what God has done for us and gave for us. And then give back in love to him and in love to other people. The second one there, things I love about my church. Uh, this again, you hear it a lot in these cards. My church is my second home. I don't know how many times I've heard, uh, you just read these cards, this church is my family. Or, you know, somebody will say, I, you know, I, my family's in New England or my family's in Florida or someplace like that. And here, this church is my family. This is my extended family. And I feel a sense of being home when I come here. This church is my second home. My family and my friends know that if I'm not home, I'm at church. The people I care about are here. Children, families, singles, saints, and sinners like Pastor Mike. Uh, what? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. But this is a place of grace. This is a place of forgiveness. This is a place that we experience the love of God. Then the next week, people who made a difference in my spiritual life uh, again, I invite you to go around and just read the names that are listed on these cards. Read the ways that people have influenced other people here. This one I, I pulled off yesterday. Uh, there are, and she says this, there are many people who have made a difference in my spiritual life, but one who stands out the most is, and there's a name, She's always willing to open her home for all kinds of events and always has a positive attitude. She demonstrates agape love always. Another is name. Same thing. Same thing. That generosity I experience from this person. That sense of love that I always experience from this person. 
It's lifting me up. And then last week, we talked about visions and hopes. And we sent out a, a card, and it says, Visions and Hopes for My Church. And this particular person, what uh, he did was, he, he says, Visions and Hope for, and he scratched out the word my, and he put over it our. Visions and Hopes for our church. Uh, listen to what he says. Growth of our church. Programs from cradle to grave. I now have the vision of a children's center on the east extension of our Christian Life Center. Uh, then enlarge our youth center over part of the children's center. This could allow a basement under and give us a safe room for all. And the basement would be painted avocado green with orange shag carpet. And <laughs> yeah. Maybe, you know, it's not quite that specific, but he is. You know, he says, oh, this extension for the youth and for the children and put a basement underneath it. He's got a vision, and it is a specific vision. Grow this church because of all these people that need the love of Jesus that are all around us. Programs to help people move forward in their discipleship and ways that we can extend this ministry. That was, I, these things are just uplifting to me. I hope they're to you. These things are also a call a call to each of us for generosity, for generosity in the way that we give of ourselves to support the ministry of the gospel, for generosity in the way that we express of our love of God in what we give. You know, what I did a couple of weeks ago was I asked one of our church members, I said, would you be willing to sit down uh, with me and let me videotape you so that you can tell me why you give? And she said, sure. So what I want to show you next is one of our church members, uh, and she's going to tell you, why it is that she gives these offerings. Would you play that? Well, when we first started stepping up to tithing, we were in a pretty tumultuous period of our lives. We had um, gone through job changes and layoffs, and we were going through parents who were aging and then the death of parents and so things have been going pretty rough and then we had our first grandchild and he was born two months premature and later we found out he had hydrocephalus so um, he ended up being in and out of the hospital for years um, first few years of his life and something haunted me with something the doctor had said and he'd said that of neurosurgeries, about one out of five end up in um, brain infections. By the age of two and a half, Noah had his fifth neurosurgery, but he made it through and we made it through. And Jim ended up going into business for himself and his business took off. I was able to quit work and do the books for him and able to stay home with my grandchildren and was there for my parents for the last year of their lives. We got to a point where we just quit asking as, as things happened, we not only stepped up our giving, but we stepped up our services to the church. And we got to the point that we just quit asking, how is this possible? We just knew that somebody bigger than us had stepped in and helped. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason that we just kept doing it because we knew that somebody was helping us all along the way. Okay. It's worked pretty well. Um, it got to the point that we don't consider it giving, we consider it paying back. It's kind of like parent and child relationship. You know, when you're a child, your parents give you gifts and they guide you and they direct you and they look forward to you opening your presents on Christmas morning and you come to expect that. But then as you mature, you realize all the things your parents have done for you and somehow you want to pay back and show them how much you love them. And I remember the first time I got to give my parents a really big Christmas present. And it was so exciting to think that for once I could do something to show how much they meant to me and how much I loved them. And that's kind of the way it is with Christ. Um, we yeah. can't give him a physical present, but we can do what he told the Apostle Peter to do a long time ago. Um, you can, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, tend my flock. And that's what we try to do. Thank you.
I'm going to talk for you a moment about what uh, my wife and I give. Uh, I use a guide, a spiritual guide. It's called a IRS 1040. Anybody ever read that spiritual guide? <laughs> Anybody ever tried to read that spiritual guide? <laughs> you know, what I do is uh, that uh, we look at our IRS 1040, our line 22. And on line 22, it's the total income for a particular year. And then we uh, take the fair rental value of the parsonage. That is, in the United Methodist system, the uh, church provides a home for the pastor. And that's part of the, the ministerial system and how uh, ministers are sent out. And so we take the fair rental value of that. I got to figure that out for my social security tax because ministers' uh, taxes are weird. Uh, and so what I do is I add that uh, line 22 and the fair rental value of the parsonage and put that together as a sum. And then I take 10% of that, and that's what we give as our tithe. And that's the foundation that we give in cash to the church. And then we do other things beyond that. Sometimes we, you know, buy things there, help things, help things out in the ministry, but buying this or that, uh, that's additional to that kind of base. Now, why do we do that? Well, you know, like I said, it's not been the easiest of years around our house, and uh, you know, it hasn't been the easiest of our years financially around our house. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you have people that have serious illnesses, it kind of makes you rethink what you have, kind of wakes you up a little bit. And, uh, you know, I thought uh, the scripture, what can I give for all that God has given me? What shall I give for all that God has given me? For my wife, uh, for my son, for the privilege of being in the ministry, for the privilege of pastoring this church, it is a privilege to pastor this church. What can I give for all that God has given to me? And I, I just think that 10% is a modest thing to give. And I, I was reading this week, um, my friend uh, Robert Stacy, this Extravagant Generosity devotional book, and uh, at one point he was talking about the story about where Jesus is in the temple and he sees this uh, poor widow coming in with two coins and she puts the two coins into the treasury in order to support the ministry of God through the temple. Uh, and he comments about the significance of that and how much she has really given. And then Robert, as he's writing that, at one point he asked this, he says, name a person who you admire and respect because of all that they hoard for themselves. Doesn't happen that way, does it? We admire and respect people who have a largeness of heart about themselves, who are generous in blessing other people. And then he says simply this, that's how we become like God, because that's who God is and who he's made us to be. Now it's our opportunity, our time to to make uh, a commitment of generosity and grow in our generosity this morning. 